So, hands up in this room who knows me, who's seen me talk here before? Okay. So most of you don't know me, but okay. So for those people that do, how many of you think that I'm shy? Okay. I, I am, or was, really, really shy. And one of the reasons I didn't, I decided I wasn't going to do this talk, and, and now I'll start, I'm going to do, was I kind of, I had a rough week, and I went back into, oh, it's that mode that you're in when you just think nobody's going to like what you say or what you do, and then after a beer, I thought, oh, fuck it, just do it. So here I am. I'm going to tell you a few lessons that I have learned about how you can go from being a really, really shy person that doesn't say anything to anybody to being somebody that does. Um, anybody in this room is shy or has been shy or can connect with what I'm saying? Great, thank you very much. Because otherwise I was going to feel really stupid. <laughs> uh, so, okay, my background, when, we, when I was about eight years old, we moved from a place I felt very comfortable to a place where I was a complete outsider, and God did they let me know it. So I went from being the usual eight-year-old, quite boisterous, tomboy kind of person to a sort of like, oh God, if I say that, they'll hit me kind of person. Which is one of the reasons I speak so fast. So I'm trying to get my words out before, before, before somebody stops me from saying anything. Now, what I have discovered is a few techniques which I want to share with you in the hope that they may help you. Um, there's no silver bullet, but the things that I have learned over the years is when you're, 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 you're sitting in the audience thinking, God, I wish I could be that person up on stage saying something right now, but I can't because I'm too shy and they won't like it, whatever. It doesn't have to be a, Greek, a, lump, a, a jump from here to there. There's incremental steps you can take along the way. So, my suggestion is you seize every opportunity you can to make a small improvement any time you can. For example, doing a lightning talk when they are on offer, because this is a great uh, opportunity. You have an audience, they will be friendly. The, the beef has been eaten, so they won't throw it. Uh, but you, no, it, it's just the, it, the, the, the chance to get up and talk in front of people and put yourself in the scary zone. That is a small step. Sometimes it's a huge step, but it's really worth taking because the more you do it, the better you get and the more comfortable you feel with doing it because you've, you've had a few things go wrong. You've had some things go catastrophically wrong and still people did not throw things. So that's my, my, my first suggestion is small incremental steps are really useful. Take them wherever you can. For example, maybe you don't want to come up and do a talk but you want to come to a meetup like this and feel more comfortable about walking into the room when nobody knows you. So my suggestion is the next time you go to a meetup and you take the goal of being talk to one person that you do not know. And I bet you, if they're looking like they don't know anybody, they will thank you for it. They will want you to do that again. And then actually it gets quite, you know, it's one of the things I do at Tech Meetup. I go and talk to people who I don't recognise, who I think, well, I don't know them, so they probably don't know anybody. I'll talk to them. No idea where that conversation will go. It's gone to some quite interesting places. So, small incremental steps. That's the first um, idea. Second idea. Bloody big stuff. Just, just jump off the cliff. Do something <laughs> you think you cannot do and figure it out on the way down. As, as in, you know, put yourself forward for conference. Once you're on stage, you have to say something. And the odds are it will be better than you think. Um, there are some physical things you can learn to do. I, I, I was on a course last week and we had a it, a, it was a business course, but they got in an improvisational, an improvising comedian to um, come talk to us. And what, she was brilliant. She's Deborah Francis White, she's at the Vine Poet. Go and see if you want to um, have a very rude uh, comedian talk about things. Anyway, she taught us some physical things because she's an improvisational comedian. So with her body, she was showing by saying the same things but with different physicality. Like, you're doing this. Obviously, you're scared. You're doing that. You're, 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 you're confident. You're doing this. You're aggressive. She was switching between these modes bloody well. And she taught us this one thing which I tried the day after she taught it and it really worked. So I want to share this with you. And it's to do with treating your... No, fit, Tricking your brain. We, this is her message from last week. Um, we are all products of the savannah. We are hunters or we are prey. So the bit where you go step back, like, sure, scary. You know, it's scary. You know, there's one of me and not 
lots of you. If I'm stepping back and going, oh, my brain is immediately thinking, oh God, I am the prey, they are the hunters, I'm going to die. If you instead go, step forward. Now, you are the prey, I am the hunter. Which one of you are going to get? That's, you can trick your brain into feeling more confident. And this might sound stupid, but I tried it, and it worked for me. So, stand central, dominant foot slightly forward. Breathe. It's just tricks your brain. The third trick I have for you is one none of us can avoid. Get older. Because <laughs> when you get to my age, you don't give so much of a shit anymore. You just get on with it. Because you, you've, the alternative of being worried about it and not doing stuff is, we, we, you don't do stuff, and then you miss out things. Get to my age, it's like, fuck it, just do it. Because then we have fun. You do things you don't expect to. And that, that's what keeps your brain alive. So that is my tips for you. Thank you very much. So I was introduced that I was going to be doing a talk about Internet of Things. That's kind of partially true. I'm going to be telling a little bit of a story and trying to make you believe that perhaps there might be a dystopian element of the Internet of Things. Um, so as, as I introduced myself before, I'm Jeff Ballinger. I work for Delta DNA as a smart tech there. I also run Mobile Monday in Edinburgh, which is where this series of talks have come out of. So anyone who's interested in mobile and the chance to talk about the mobile development one, I need to chat to you at some point. Um, <coughs> Also involved with mobile duty. Yeah, that's got all my affiliations out of the way. Much before. Um, so before we get into the Internet of Things stuff, I need to convince you of one thing first, which is that our view of normal in this world, what people see as normal, is a really, really myopic thing. It's really narrow. And you look at these wonderful gents here. They are doing things which a couple of years down the line, yeah, you know, we'll all be doing. Every one of us, we like that guy on the cover of Time magazine. I don't know if you've seen the guy with the VR headset looking slightly strange in Time magazine. <laughs> we'll all be like that. And we'll think it's totally normal. Ten years ago, the idea that we're wandering around these things, connecting to the internet all the time, doing all, everything via this, would have been ludicrous to the vast majority of people. And now it's ludicrous if you think you can't do it. Normal moves, normal changes. Right. So, internet of things. I, I start, this is coming out of a talk I prepared, I did a much larger talk I did uh, over the last few months, and I'm trying to work out what it is, so it's all the usual things, and out in the world, lots of new devices appearing, devices which can collect data, all those wonderful things that we can then do with that, obviously machine to machine has been around for a while, but now we're having these things that you can actually build, you can, the devices are out there and you can aggregate new services out of them, devices also collect data, devices <coughs> do things, it's in your cars, it's some people will say wearables are all part of Internet of Things. More random people say drones are as well. It's all a bit interesting where the boundary actually is. Um, so while I was researching that, I came across something which slightly surprised me in this position on it. So slide. At the Internet of Things Summit, at the beginning of the year, this gent, who is a very well respected man in, in IT in general, in big corporate IT, said the Internet of Things <coughs> is the end of civilization as we know it. I thought, well, that's an opinion. Perhaps we need to dig into that and, and try and work out what, what are you talking about? You know, what, what, why would that be? Um, and it comes down to the security area. Now, the privacy is interesting, I think, as well, but we'll avoid that because that's a huge can of talk in itself. But fundamentally, it's like things, thousands and thousands of little devices put out in the world, a lot of them very, very, most of them very, very cheap devices. They have to be for lots of them. And they're out in the field, they're physically accessible, a lot of them. They're deployed for 10 years or, or more without any updates going to them at all. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> how, how often do we update our phones? Um, some work has been done in this area. Uh, Armour doing some interesting work into this sort of thing about, about establishing trust from silicon and 
pathway of trust all the way through, which is fascinating stuff. Um, but that actually ends up being you have to be running Android on the device. Not cheap in my thing. Devices, that's quite a heavy one to put on that. Uh, DSMA are, of course, great leaders in this space and going to be at the front, forefront of it all are just starting to think about it. Um, oh, that's a very interesting topic in the World Congress issue. Other organizations, people say, they're sort of jumping, jumping the gun a bit and actually starting to think about it. <coughs> kind of important stuff, really. But why is it important, though? Slide. You get difficult situations if you don't secure these devices out there. Um, this is a fairly silly example, I mean, This probably wasn't even done over the internet. They probably done something, drove up to it and reprogrammed the little Windows PC that was sitting and driving the thing. But as all of these things in the world become connected and therefore accessible, potentially, then things like this can be done. Now, this is a funny example. You have to make a laugh as you drive past. Then think about it, one of those tops of the motorway signboards where with all the lanes being been given, and you'll have this one closed, this one open, this one open, this one closed, this one closed, this one open, flash. Could do quite a lot of damage quite quickly that way, couldn't you? Attack surface, thing security. That's uh, more interesting. Uh, and you might have seen in the press recently, one of the big categories of internet of things, devices now are some of the smarter new cars. They are permanently connected over GSM, signaling going both ways. They're feed, you're feeding your, your little cameras in the front. You can be storing it off onto your, onto your cloud accounts. You've got up, updates and things coming down. And they, man, and they managed to, from a remote location, turn the brakes on one of these cars. I think I was into it on the gar Guardian. Desktop mm -hmm. was a time. Yeah, but there's been. There's been Oh, that's a bit scary. Um, it's a tax surface. This is a huge attack surface. So, slide. Uh, a few more examples from things I've been told. These are real Internet of Things products. There are 3D food printers, which you can plug onto the Internet and will download recipes over the, over from the Internet and make, them, and make them for you without having very much intervention. There are there's a product which you can attach to your shower, where it will monitor how long your child is spending in the shower and will start making it colder and colder and colder after a certain point. And you can monitor this over your smartphone and make the decision to when it switches off or when it goes stony cold. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> so, great idea for the positive use case. Now, if you've got an internet of things, a security system on your bathroom door as well, you can have something which will lock you into the bathroom and scold you to death of the shower in the wrong circumstances. That's probably probably try and close the loop now. Because you've got the huge big sky idea of there'll be this fast AI, Google, Google's cloud will, will upgrade itself to self-awareness and will take over the world through the military industrial complex where giant robots will come out and shoot us all. No, the, it will probably be, maybe the first bit may happen, but what it'll do is it'll probably take, out, take over our automatic food printers and poison us. Or it will scald us to death in the shower. It will be, we, we are building this attack surface now for all of those nasty AIs or <coughs> more realistically, nasty people trying to nasty people trying to do these things, that's much more of an immediate threat. We're giving them attack surface. And so we should probably be concerned about this and we should probably think when we hear an IoT we should probably ask, what's security mentioned in this discussion? At every stage. Just want to acknowledge the cartoons I've used, which are a great guy called Terry Anderson who they made them for us at the last moment we were at. Um, and in those old as well, thank you for listening. <coughs>
I'm Richard. I'm lucky enough to work here at Skyscanner on mobile architecture. Um, and I was thinking back about almost 10 years, actually, when I was preparing for this talk. And I used to use, I, I used to work on a pretty complicated, for the time at least, web application. Um, and there was a tool that came along back then that changed my day-to-day -day life, if not my life. Um, and that tool was uh, Firebug. Next slide, please. Um, so this was 2006, so almost 10 years. Um, Firebug changed web development massively, I think, for, for everyone who installed it. Um, before it came along, what happened in the browser, for most developers, was a bit of a black box. You used to debug by tailing server logs whilst refreshing the, the page in the browser. And you saw a portion of what was occurring, but not everything, particularly as Ajax took off. Um, and what I thought was really interesting about it was it was incredibly accessible. It was like view source um, in the browser. It made everything visible to anyone who wanted to look at it. Um, and one of the, the key things that came out of it, the most interesting bit for me, was the, the performance network tab, um, which was the first time I'd seen this kind of view of all the resources that were being loaded for my page, the performance, how long the DNS lookups took, how long it took to download. Um, and I think really it started a whole conversation around web performance that didn't exist previously. Um, we skip on a, a few years, not, not many actually, um, this tool, which is Web Page Test, uh, <coughs> and it sort of extended some of the concepts from Firebug, um, the waterfall charts of the network requests going, going from the browser, but it let you run this across lots of browsers in an automated fashion. Um, and th this is important for a few reasons. One, you can run it as part of your build process, so you can discover changes over time um, as, you, as you build your app. Um, but the other thing that's important is it gives you lots of metrics about performance, and you can use these um, in something called a performance budget, which is a more recent concept that's come along. So the idea is you set some figures um, for page load time, uh, for page weight, that you, as a business, find acceptable. Um, and then you run your automated test and you check that you're under your budget. Um, check that you're delivering your page quickly enough, it's light enough weight. Um, and the powerful thing about this, particularly for developers, is you can then go and have an argument with marketing when they want to add some new ad unit or uh, some new tracker to your site, um, because that's going to add some page weight, so then you can get them to remove something else you don't like. Um, so that's what's been happening on the web. Um, on native, things are a little bit behind. Um, on this, so we're regarding native apps, um, thinking about network performance and the network requests behind the scenes, which is what these apps depend on largely, in, in the most part, certainly the ones we build here. It sort of is the situation, you know, you sat on a really fast office Wi-Fi network, I've got no idea what the line is coming into here, but it's pretty fast. Um, you run the app, uh, you run a build of the app in the simulator, you run it even on a real device, and you're sat there on the super fast network connection, everything's fine. You push it out into the world, and you get all these one-star reviews because you're downloading huge amounts of data, or your app's performing really slowly on a, on a uh, 3G connection. And that's really weird because we know a lot about performance these days and how it affects usage of apps. We know that conversion rates go down if, if, an app, if a website or an app performs more slowly. Um, we also know that mobile is one of the most hostile environments for network you can imagine. You know, everyone here knows what it's like trying to get chunk of data over 3G or even worse, edge. Um, so what it seems to me is we're, we're missing this visibility on what's occurring um, behind our apps. Um, there are some tools that start to do this. So there are some open source projects, one from Facebook for Android, another one from Stripe for iOS, which try and replicate Firebug um, and that network waterfall uh, for native apps. But you have to embed things within your app code in order to enable them. And it suffers from the same problem as Firebug in that the developer has to actually choose and look, choose to look for the data, um, which they'll only do if there's an issue. Uh, what you want to do is trend it over time, which is what web page test does really well. Um, so what I've been using recently is a new project that's come along called um, Browser Mob Proxy. And I think it's been around for a little while, but it's been used largely in the uh, web test world. So there's a, a project called Selenium that it came out of. Uh, this is a proxy server. There's nothing particularly special about it initially when you look at it. Um, but it's good that it's a proxy server because it means any device that uses HTTP 
can be configured to use it without any customization whatsoever. So there's no hacks, there's no jailbreaking to enable performance debugging, just set an HTTP proxy. Um, what's special about it, three things. One, it has a REST API to control it. So you can programmatically start a new proxy, turn things on or off, control it. Second thing that's special about it is it does bandwidth shaping. Um, so you can tell it to simulate a 3G connection. You can tell it to add 250 milliseconds latency. Um, so you can really simulate a, a, a mobile environment. And the third really important thing is you can record sessions of traffic going through it as a HAR file. And a HAR file actually loops us back to Firebug because the net panel in Firebug begat the HAR file format eventually, and, and that's used by uh, web page tests as well. And what this is effectively is all the data that sits behind that waterfall diagram. So it's details of when the request start, when they ended, how many bytes it was, etc. cetera. Um, so if you put all these things together, and you have a continuous integration environment which runs your app under an automation test. So perhaps it launches Skyscanner, does a search, picks the first flight that's available. And you, can tr you have that running through the proxy. You can generate a waterfall of your entire uh, request flow. And you can do performance budgeting against the stats that come out in that half hour, um, which I think could be a really exciting way to do um, performance tracking on uh, mobile apps. And the really cool thing about it is it's a proxy, even things like smart TVs work through it. So things that have no real debugging interfaces whatsoever, often you can still test them in this kind of way. Um, and the other good thing is it comes out with metrics, and metrics, sorry, next time. Metrics means you can graph things, and uh, as they say at Etsy, if it moves, graph it. If it doesn't graph it anyway in case it moves later. Um, we love graphs here, so I'm looking forward to us um, preparing some more graphs out of the uh, browser mod proxy. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so, uh, let me just run the next slide. Here we go. So, I'm a replacement speaker for much of my colleagues. So, I have a few here. I don't know how the slides go. <laughs> well, I'll try my best. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so he asked me to start with a question. And he says that, uh, has anyone in the room been uh, stressed or felt anxious or depressed? Uh, has never felt anxious or depressed or uh, stressed in his life? Is it there anyone? Then can raise their hands. No? Then I think that app which we have built is for that guy or uh, for everyone. Ah, next slide. So we have come with this app called Soulite and it helps improve the mood through musical mindfulness. Uh, it's also called a well-being companion because it's going to be there with you uh, in your smartphone 24-7. Next slide, please. So what's happening is that uh, there's been a lack of uh, mental well-being in our society, uh, which is now a uh, chronic condition. One in four UK adults uh, experience mental distress in their lifetime. That's the statistics of the World Health Organization. And it manifests in different type of uh, conditions like stress, anxiety, and even depression. And this is just tip of the iceberg because many more are unreported because of stigma, confidentiality, self-denial, and fear. Now, okay. There are three basic approaches to uh, treating this sort of symptoms or even preventing those symptoms. First is you pop up some pills, which is basically uh, found to be less than 1% effective in most of the cases. Then there's the cognitive behavioral therapy, where it's just like a talk therapy. There's a counselor who's going to come and then attend on your problems and try to rectify it. But then the question comes about availability. It's not available to you at all the times. When you are most stressed, it's not available to you. And then it's also a question of affordability because uh, these are expensive. Uh, you get a therapist and a therapist, which is one-to-one -one sessions, these are very, very expensive. And NHS uh, seldom pays for it. Uh, so the third option is basically what we have come up with, is the, the digital option, where now various self-help tools are available, which is there in your smartphone, is going to help you all the time. Uh, and so light falls into this category. Next slide, please. Now, so light, uh, 
it basically improves your mood through musical mindfulness. Uh, it's also your mobile well-being companion. We are inspired to, by uh, music therapy, artificial intelligence, positive psychology, and uh, mindfulness. We are uh, part of the experiential uh, paradigm. So uh, there's no quantification, there's no measurement, there's no analysis, or there's no inference. In fact, we don't even try to intellectualize uh, the uh, emotional problems. Uh, what happens is that, you know, through music, through color, through emoticons, we try to uh, help you become aware and connect with your emotions, and which leads you to a better emotional state. So, here it is. That's the first screen where you try to uh, become aware of your emotions. And we use uh, very uh, few uh, things. We just use a single word. Uh, there's an emoticon. Uh, there is a color and there's a music. You have to find your mood and resonate with it. So there's no thinking involved. There's no reading. There's no analyzing. You have to just feel and experience what you are feeling at the right moment. And it is to be. It's basically sort of a Fitbit for mental health. It's like self quantification of the mental fitness. Okay. The second screen is after you have quantified your mood, say you are depressed or you are feeling low or you are feeling okay, then you select that uh, mood. And then once you select that mood, then you try to accept uh, what your emotions are in the current uh, being. So uh, we lead you through customized music uh, and customized color. You explore your current mood, or if you are not happy with the current mood, then you can explore nearby moods as well. Research shows that it is quite therapeutic uh, because you try to process your emotions, you experience, and then you release that emotions through uh, music and color. Next slide, please. Uh, and thirdly, that's the most interesting part. It's like it's moving forward. Once you have uh, conceptualized that you know this is what my mood, present mood is you would like to move forward. So what you do is try to improve your mood uh, from a negative mood to a positive mood. And all these things, we lead it through color and through music. And we lead gradually, so there's no like sudden jump from one emotion to another emotion. Because it is more therapeutic uh, uh, for you to uh, emotion, uh, change your emotions quite gradually. Uh, the popular journeys are generally stress to relax, uh, gloomy to happy, joyful to calm, and we recommend using of high quality uh, headphones for getting your best experience. And the last slide is like, if you have Android phone, that's download link, and the iOS device is coming soon, very shortly, and follow us on Facebook. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna have another 15 minute break here. Um, all these speakers, feel free to grab them if you've got questions, and can have a chat page, just for the game, and we'll start again about half past. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> it's not. It's okay. 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 Okay.
I I 
I've decided to go out to the pub, I've got some, got some friends that said yeah, right. So, and I know these guys pretty well, so I know what they like, you know, not all about the best of taste, but you know. So, and I know the pub we're going to, so I know what the pub sells. So I need to think about how I'm going to buy this round. So I need to think about finding something for each person that they like that is also sold by the pub. So, I can do that by looking at the relationships. So what I've done is I've taken connected data and, and understood the relationships in it. And I've found new information from that. This is fundamentally what graph databases help you do. They help you model relationships as first class entities in your data store. So there's a few examples of companies that are doing this in production. So Shuttle, I don't know if any of you have heard of it, it's a company that's owned by eBay now, they help you get something moved from A to B. So they manage a network of uh, couriers that have available slots. So they model all this in graph databases. Their move to graph databases helped them go from queries that took minutes to queries that took seconds, milliseconds even. They actually had um, their first version, they had a query that took longer than their shortest delivery time. <laughs> so, Another example is Gamesys. They are a games company based in London. And they took on graph databases because they, they model massively multiplayer games. And they wanted to say, right, well, we need to understand how people are using it and how we can encourage engagement. So they modeled all the in-world entities and modeled the user behavior so they could understand. They could look at that model and say, well, if we make this item more discoverable, can we make it more engaging for the user? And finally, there's Walmart, which are doing similar things to Amazon in using the customer's purchase history to provide recommendations. So I highly recommend this book, Graph Databases, uh, at graphdatabases.com. Uh, it's available for free. Download it. It will give you a complete insight into what graph databases are and how they work and how you can model data in graph databases. 
And that's actually my talk. I realise that's quite short. But there you go. So thank you. For the diagrams? Well, what programming language can you Oh, for the slides? For, for the class. Okay, oh, right. How, um, how much query is So, one example is Neo4j. Um, it's an example of a graph database. And you can use, they have their own language called Cypher for querying it. Because it's built to handle the differences with graph databases. Okay, so uh, next talk is Tim. Okay. Yep. So, hello. Um, I'm going to start with a question as well, which is, how many WhatsApp messages would you think are sent in a day? Is it a million? Hundred million? Any hands for hundred million WhatsApp messages in a day? Five hundred million? Billions. All of these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <politicians>. So. Uh, <laughs> You know what the question means. It's like, play, uh, 50 billion, just to cut you short. Wow. Uh, so 50 billion WhatsApp messages and 21 billion. Five zero or one five? B billion. B five five zero, fifty. So five zero fifty. Sorry, billion WhatsApp messages. Messages. 21 SMS. 21 billion SMS messages in a day. So um, we think we have something that'll be useful. Uh, so, uh, you can just jump straight through that. So, uh, next. <coughs> so, smartwatches. Um, this is a Mojo 360. It sucks. <laughs> it's got a nice big screen. Uh, that's it. That's the only good thing about it. It's got this stupid shelf, which um, we call it a flat tire because it's like a circle with a bite at the bottom of it, which makes our app not work very well. With. It's just uh, it's crap. But there are nice ones. LG Urbane. Lovely watch. Um, and cheapest we've seen so far is 120 quid for a, a, a Sony Smartwatch 3, which is quite nice. And then you've got things like the 330 quid, you've got the uh, Samsung something, gear something. Uh, anyway, and then obviously you've got the sort of Apple watches, um, up to 16 grand. So between 1 in 10 and 3 in 10 people apparently are considering buying one shortly. Um, the watch manufacturers are crapping themselves because all of a sudden all the phone OEMs manufacturers are just um, taking all their market share. So the big companies like Swatch, Tag Heuer, Breitling are piling into this market as well. Um, sales have gone up nearly 500% in a year, um, but then that's from a very low number. So it's a, you know dodgy stats there. But 75% Apple have grabbed already. Uh, I don't I don't know if that's by numbers or. Uh, um, by money or actual devices sold, uh, and they're a bit secretive, obviously. Um, one thing you notice if you've worn, has anybody got one? How many people have got these? It's not that many, I'd say. Fewer than, fewer than 10, I'd say, in here. Um, they're quite different to a phone. They're quite intimate. You get used to them. There's no, you don't need to password them because they're immediately available and you know if somebody's nicked it. Um, and so they're immediate and they're quite intimate because they're sort of part of, sort of worn right next to you rather than sort of part of the things you carry. Um, they're currently passive notification devices paired with a phone. So you get uh, a message that sort of says you've just got a new email, gives you a little bit of it, gives you a text message. But they're going to be self, uh, they're going to be standalone. There are going to be times when you're out and you leave your phone at home. Um, they're also sort of something in a meeting. You sort of it's easier to just sort of respond on this than to um, dig your phone out, and so you don't have to wrestle your phone out of your bag or your pocket or find it, and it's more discreet. You can just send a quick message in a meeting. Um, also, you're not going to drop it. So, as proof that people are using these for more than trivial things, and they're actually entering information, there's been 100,000 downloads of a browser that's available for smartwatches um, on um, Android. So 
Um, and obviously you're going to be entering text to ask questions and do searches and things. Um, so, I was going to say, did you just that? Yeah, okay, so currently, <coughs> the only way you can enter text on, a, an AMS, uh, on an Apple Watch or an Android one, unless you're in dev mode on an Android device, is speech. And it sucks. I mean, a friend, uh, I think I've already sworn already, so I'll just swear again. So a friend of mine sent me a text message, and he did say, fuck you. And the thing that came out at the other end was, I love you. <laughs> and it wasn't that much background noise either. Um, so <coughs> we have a way of entering text using the screen. So yeah, that's, that's your stats. Um, I was going to... Uh, next. So we contend that people will want to write on these devices, but the screens are too small. They're a nightmare to, to get much um, happening on. Uh, and the trouble with the pre-cooked answers is, uh, um, so you get these things such as I love you and see you in five minutes, but the problem is if you want to see somebody in 45 minutes and the only options are 30 and an hour. So, <laughs> or anything basically a bit more commun um, communicative than that. So we have this solution which we've named 2C, that's a designer's choice of name, who likes it? <laughs> okay, so some marks in Steve. Uh, and what we have is a novel UI and really clever abbreviation expansion underneath, which I'll talk about in a bit. Okay, so this is my app, uh, it's been out for ages, nobody knows it's there. Uh, please download it, please give it five stars. It, uh, that's the pro version, 4.7 out of five stars. Genuine uh, reviews from real people, not friends. Um, and it does word prediction, word completion, everybody does that. It does auto correction, everybody does that. But it uniquely does abbreviation expansion. So, what that means is you pick the letters. So, technology, you just sort of go, I don't know, T C N G. And they go, technology. So, you type much better. Uh, Basically, I could, I, it works better than word completion. And it works great on something where you can only enter a few letters at a time very slowly. Uh, next one, please. So, based on my PhD <coughs> in Scrabble, uh, so basically I looked at how you could help somebody with a motor disability where their speech, sorry, where their, they have problems, difficulties with speech, so they use keyboards and they uh, every keystroke is slow and tiring to enter. So if you can come up with something that takes a minimal amount of input, uses a bunch of natural language processing techniques to cleverly re-expand that into what they intended to type as fast as possible, that's helpful. Then phones came along, I could see an application for those of the same tech. Um, I did quite a clever algorithm that worked. Um, and then these came along. So um, what came out of the PhD, sorry, is uh, Everybody uses, everybody has a knowledge of information theory, even if they don't know what information theory is. So, everybody's played Scrabble, they know that certain letters are rarer, they carry more information, they tell you more about what a word might be. So you leave out the vowels, you use the rarer letters, like the, if there's a Z in there, you use that quickly, a K, with an H possibly. So, um, we harness that. So, the current uh, alternatives, this is Flexi, they've got a load of money. Um, so they use two thirds of the keyboard, but you've got, this, you've got a massive finger. I'm trying to pass on the Anyway, imagine. So that's your finger, and you, you sort of press on there, and you know it's one of about eight letters. You've got a massive discount for each press, each letter could be anything. So you've got this gigantic. Um, Thing with probability matrix with <laughs> um, just a ridiculous amount of uh, ambiguity that you've got to try and work your way through. Uh, don't think I've um, this is also this is called Minuon, which works quite cleverly on a phone, but I would say it suggests it's a really bad idea on one of these because it increases the, uh, the problem by a factor of three. Because what it does is it condenses the entire alphabet, the entire keyboard, onto one line. So just by how far left or right you are, it then has to work out. Um, I suppose I actually, no, I think it is actually even more ambi ambiguous than, than the other one. Um, 
what it does give you is it gives you more refs of the screen. Uh, this has got five tiles, again, quite a heavy cognitive load on the user. You've got these five squares. And I think it's something to do with like you, you swipe up and right for one letter and up and left for another and so on. Um, again, uh, I don't know what else to add to that. So that's, that's five tiles. Thank you. This is, um, I can't remember, remember the name of this, but it's, again, it's not a bad idea. You, you selectively zoom in with taps until you get a sort of zone of the keyboard and then you hold the press and that's your key selection. So it's probably not a bad idea. Uh, this is Microsoft's solution and they've gone for the approach that we have which is to use the whole screen for each letter rather than trying to use a whole keyboard on the screen at once. Um, this is a version of, do you, do you remember, any, have you seen something like that before? You too. Yeah, so it's like uh, graffiti on the palm, or the Newton. Uh, this Newton was Apple. palm. Thank you. Palm. That was it was palm. Yeah. I remember. Okay, so uh, yeah, so it's graffiti. It's like graffiti, but it's not completely identical. Uh, this is the nearest to ours. I can't remember what it's called, unfortunately. But um, so it's like a circular arrangement of the alphabet, and then suggestions there, and then what you type so far there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, slight cognitive load on that one as well. Uh, I've watched the video several times, I can't understand what's going on. Uh, but uh, anyway, so that's that's the competition. So I haven't given them a good kick in. <laughs> this is where we place ourselves. Uh, plug, plug, plug. Highly, highly accurate, <coughs> highly fast, and very low cognitive load. So, circular arrangement of letters. Um, we've only half built it so far, so there's a beta. Um, your text comes here. Um, you've got a sort of joypad thing there for sort of swipe left to undo, swipe right to redo, and then suggestions there, and we're going to make that zoomable as well. So the clever bit is, so you start typing, and you hold one of the letters, oh, you, and it projects this sort of beam across the, the other side of the screen. So, fits on a circular watch, which half of them are, makes the letter bigger and easier to read, and because we're in a sort of zoom mode, we give you fine control that you wouldn't have otherwise. So, quite a big movement only takes you sort of one or two letters a month at a time. And then you let go, uh, so I was going for the T, I got the S, so I sort of moved up slightly, got the, uh, the T, sorry, and then let go again. So got two, the, and that. Just tap those to select the word. Um, but I'm going for an S, so I've got, um, so I've got TS, and it's offering me this, which is an abbreviation expansion, hits, and these. So you just tap any of those to select and insert. Uh, Next word prediction kicks in, so is, I just tap that and I get is. And then, fantastic, I get in three letters. And it's a completely cooked example, obviously, but <laughs> when you try it out, you'll find it does actually work. And it's, it's a, we reckon it's a pretty good solution to this um, problem. <coughs> so uh, these are pretty things that the designers did. I actually, I'm just going to film this, if I may. So. Does anybody object? <laughs> no. Is that okay if I just film it's the response to this? Okay. Well, let's be filmed. It, that's a point, actually. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not filming the audience. Yeah, exactly. Not the audience. Thank you. So, hi, could you, um, <laughs> could you be able to turn the camera over to the audience, please? No, it's you impossible. Can't. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what are we going to do? So, we have different options for. Have it. Does anybody else do this? You shoot a brilliant bit of film and you press stop and it starts counting. <laughs> <laughs> Constantly doing it. Right, so sound filming. So, um, so this is one alternative to des design. I'm not going to tell you which one I prefer or any of the other team members prefer. So, so we're having a discussion about which one we should release as a sort of um, canon one with a sort of generic version of 2C. 
So option one is you hold down your, your, your letter there and it projects, you've still got that sort of zoom mode, so a big movement around here would only cover like, like one letter rather than three or four. Do you see what I mean? Kind of zoom. So it projects it into the center, makes it big. So that's one option. Another option is it kind of beams it out of the center in that kind of way. And then another one, the sort of fan effect that I showed you, with or without colors. So I'm going to, can you back up just a couple? So whose preference is for the one with the big dot in? Okay. Next, please. Preference for that one? One, two, three, four. And for the, the fan in color or black and white? Probably the dot, I would say, more people for the dot. Thank you. Uh, right, so the risks are currently, Apple took something like six years to open up the iPhone to third party keyboards. Um, they may never, it may, they may take six years to do it for this as well. Um, and at the, mo at the moment, you have to be in dev mode to make it work on an Android device as well. Uh, they may not catch on, but Apple up there, Initial run from 17 million to 20 million, so that was one small um, thing in our favour. And then the really big question is whether people will want to make 30 second interactions via their watch instead of their phone. Uh, I think that's probably it, actually. That's, yeah, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. is because after the last talk I gave, which was at Volker Blog, somebody came up to me and said, God, you're really smug when you're giving a talk. And the stuff in this thing is going to make me even smugger. However, as we all know, the best talks start with a question, as do some shit ones. <laughs> so here we have a quick question for you. Together, a battery ball costs one pound ten, the bat costs one pound more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Hands up if you think it's 10p. Hands up if you think it's 5p. Right. 80% of students will say eight, uh, 10p. Everybody I've asked this question to since I came across the button, one has said 10p. And the reason they say that, I'll give you the correct answer, because I thought it that. And the reason they say that is because your brain thinks in two separate ways. And for this, you have a blog called, well, this is like Mal Malcolm Gladwell says, 10,000 10, hours makes you an expert. So the next question is, how many hours of economics lectures does it take you to win a Nobel Prize in economics? To say, if you think about it for too long, if your name is Daniel Canahan, it's zero. He's never had an economics lesson in his life but he has a 2002 Nobel Prize for Economics for a thing called prospect theory, which is about how people evaluate the outcome of a decision, which is they do it to the wrong way. And he propounds there are two methods of thought. You have what he calls system one, which is the answer for the, the question, you know, the 10p one. That question was specifically designed to make you say 10p. So if you immediately thought 10p, don't worry about it, you're being fucked with. <laughs> in most cases, and this is why, because the talk is about, not, I'm not selling anything, this is how to make your users buy more stuff. You have to know how they think. And the most of the time, system one is how they think. So you present them with a screen, and they go right, and do something straight away. Your problem is, you have been spending system two, which is slower, more deliberate, and more logical, when you're designing everything. You think, ah, it does it this way, it does it this way. Then somebody comes along and goes, 
Oh, oh, fuck. I'll give you an example. Last night I was with a, a friend of mine and she was buying a book from a well-known book aggregation site, which is very, very good, called Lose Me. And it came up the screen and there was a, there's a little button in the screen which says, sign up free. My friend Adele saw that and said, there's a sign up fee. <laughs> you know, immediately her brain and sister one said, shit, this is going to cost me money. The person is, Rachel has this and she's probably going to change it when she gets home. <laughs> but I don't know how. <laughs> and I'm now going to demonstrate both systems of thinking at once. Who has not seen that diagram? It's called the Muller Liar Illusion. You haven't seen it. Which line is longer, top or bottom? The same. Sorry? The same. Right. Those, both those lines are the same. Your system two thinking says, I've seen this before, I'm not going to get caught out. Those lines are both the same. Stick up a hand if you cannot see the top line is longer. The top line is longer. To me, the top line is longer. I can see it's longer. That's your system one brain saying, forget that. This is the instant answer. This will get you out of trouble when the lions come round the corner. <laughs> now we have another question. There'll be a, a show of hands at the end of it. One of those statements is wrong. Okay? Stick up your hand if you think Hitler was born in 1892. Stick up your hand if you think Hitler was born in 1887. Right. You've just done this the wrong way. We're <laughs> <laughs> primed. Yeah. You're being primed. It's a psychology technique of priming. <laughs> and supposedly, I was pretty sure you'd look it up. <laughs> it happens. If you put something in bright red or bright blue, people will pay more attention to it than if you do it in a sort of like middling colours of yellow or green or even in faint blue or faint red. Also, if you put stuff in bold, people will pay more attention to the stuff that isn't in bold. And I know if you're printing stuff that you want people to take note of, put it in as high quality paper as you can and use the best printer you can. People will pay more attention to it. One of the, main ex one of the, the well quoted experiments they did of priming was done at New York University. What they did was they got a bunch of people in, one at a time, and they said, here is five words, make a four letter sentence out of it. So we feel it, he finds it instantly, things like that. The subjects were divided into two groups. One group got a sentence like that, the other group got a set of words like that. And then they were told to go to another room. And the experiment wasn't about them making up the sentences or what happened in the second room. The experiment was how long it took them to walk between the two rooms. <laughs> <laughs> and they found that people who you gave sort of oldish words to went slower than people who had non-old words. Absolutely fascinating thing. The last thing you need to know for for arsing around with your users, <laughs> is the peak end rule. Now the peak end rule is absolutely fascinating. What it says is an experience, which can be any experience, which has a beginning, a middle, and an end, like this talk, for example, or the whole evening, you will it is defined by moments within it. And the moment that usually defines it is the end. Oops, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> What Daniel Canahan did was he got people who had been given colonoscopies. And they were random. I've never had a colonoscopy. I have been told this fairly grim. And what they did with it was the people were divided into two groups. There was group A who got, you know, the wiggle, 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 and then out again. And there was the second group who got that roof in, wiggle, 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 and then they left it alone for three minutes still in there and then took it out. So the, the first group had a quicker experience than the second group. And the second group had more pain because the thing was in left longer. But the bit they had was at the end and it wasn't as painful as the peak pain bit. And when they asked them afterwards, the people who'd had extra pain at the end said, this is much better experience than the people who didn't have the extra bit at the end. And they also found that the people who'd had the extra three minutes of stuff were more likely to come back for a second one. <laughs> now, this is the thing. One way that you've all experienced it is restaurants. 
the last thing that happens in most <laughs> restaurants <laughs> is you pay the bill. And restaurants are usually shit at giving you the bill. Because you say, could I have the bill, please, at the moment you're ready to leave? Five minutes later, they tootle it up and they say, oh, go off and get the machine. And they come back and they so your peak end of your restaurant thing is being fucked around how you're paying the bill. There used to be a restaurant called El Bulli, which for years was the number one restaurant in the world. And what El Bulli did, it charged you 250 euros for your food, plus drink. And at the end of the meal, after you'd paid the bill, they brought you a box of chocolates. And that is the box of chocolates wow. you got, which is quite an awesome box of chocolates. And the way you can have the peak end rule to your stuff is if you're getting people to pay for something, put your price up, give them an extra 25 quid, but give them an Amazon voucher for 20 quid. They'll never, so if you don't tell them it's coming, their last six weeks is, fuck, they've given me 20 quid back, and they'll think you're much better. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Ventures. Uh, thank the other organisers for helping us. Um, uh, the, other, the speakers will still be around to kind of chat just now. If you're not chatting, it'd be great if you'd help us tidy up and get ready. I think we're going to go to the pear tree after this and hopefully find some space. Maybe some folk will have gone off to the shows. You will have to fight your way through George Square, but I'm sure you can you can make it. Um, and I think that's about it. Do we want the chairs away? Uh, do we want the chairs away? Richard here. Uh, Excellent. So don't you don't need to just wait, but if you could tidy up the, the cans and stuff like that, just <coughs> 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 <coughs>